All right, let's get started. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm going to talk about using EGs and specifically something I made for the Muse that you can connect to P5. So if anyone else is interested, working with biosensors uh, over the last two weeks, I've created this uh, template that uh, will work in P5. Um, I'll give a very fast overview of how I got here, but mostly want to focus on what I've learned from working with biosensors and how to make music or visuals from them. Um, I first started with uh, hardcore music, so this is a photo from a hardcore show years ago. Uh, I made music that was very experimental, very hardcore, very small crowds, uh, but like little niche uh, popularity all around the world. Um, but yeah, lots lots of uh, very small shows. So like this is a huge crowd compared to some of my hardcore shows. Uh, I went from making hardcore into making more ambient music, which led to uh, film scores. So I made horror film scores for a while, which is a ton of fun. It's like you're turning the knobs on people's emotions, like telling them what to feel and when to feel. Because you can have the same shot of like a house, and if the music is happy, you're like, oh, this is a sitcom. Or if it's like this dreadful music, you're like, something bad is going to happen. And so in a way, that started to introduce me to the idea of uh, shaping emotions very consciously uh, with sound. I'm cranking through this great uh, fast, this is great. Um, next, I started working with, in 2009, I started experimenting with how to make music besides just using Ableton and drum machines and synthesizers. And I started building a generative app. Uh, and essentially what I would do is you would tap the screen and it started to create these looping compositions that would evolve over time. It was generative music. Over a couple of years, from like 2009 to 2014, not consistently, but um, working on it here and there, in 2014 I started to, instead of creating a random sequence, you know, back to the user, I started to incorporate the user's taps, like what instruments did they choose, how often did they choose those instruments, and by doing that, I kind of stumbled backwards into an AI. I was like, oh, I made an AI. Like, I'm creating a system that learns from the user and then gives something back to them uh, that is similar to them. And another thing I stumbled into is something called the genetic algorithm. So if you ever get into algorithms or AI, there's something called the genetic algorithm where instead of giving the user back exactly what they've made and I put it through this type of stress test, it's like this Darwinian stress test where when it's considering to generate a new note, it looks at all the notes that the user has chosen. And instead of, let's say they've chosen note 64 a hundred times and note uh, 30 uh, only five times. So in a normal situation, the an AI might always go to the one that's chosen more and feed that back. But what I would do is I would take those different probabilities and run them through this kind of the stress test of uh, kind of a randomizer and testing against that randomizer. So occasionally the one that was selected last would win because occasionally like David beats Goliath. And what that ended up happening is the people who use this system, they're like, it sounds like me, but it's like me in a few months or like next year, the, there was this like element of surprise or un unexpectedness of the people that would use this app a lot. Um, some of it also is something I learned this summer, the Liza effect. So when you have just a little bit of randomization in a system, people will assign meaning to it. So if most of the system makes sense, like for example, the wooden mirror out here, you walk by it, it shows you your image. But what if occasionally it showed like a slightly different image, just randomly, like every like four days. So it was like you and then like something else. People were like, is there a ghost here? Like what triggers that? And people would try to figure out and create meaning when it could just be this like random algorithm occasionally showing like a different face, which is super creepy now that I think about that, but. Um, so I worked with AI for a couple of years and essentially it was my robot bandmate. So I would choose the synthesizers and turn the knobs, but it would play all the notes. So it was doing the composition and then I was doing the uh, modulation on the sounds. And that pairing, and it created these like really beautiful kind of emergent phenomenon where these compositions would come out. Like I'm the only person up on stage, so if I'm here and you know the the AI is on an app here, 
I would have these moments of surprise where I'd be like, whoa, that was really good, like as if there's another bandmate. And so I started to hear the music new as if I were the audience member. So I was hearing it new and everyone was hearing it rather than traditionally with making music, that moment of creation, which is really wondrous, would happen alone in the studio. So I'd be alone, I'd be jamming on my headphones or whatever, and I'd make something cool and I'd be like, this is great. But by the time other people heard it, maybe it was a month later, a year later, 10 years later, where other people would, and so it was removed from that moment of creation. So one of the great things about generous music was I experienced that surprise and that aha at the same time as everyone else. Uh, I messed around a little bit with processing in terms of triggering uh, video loops with notes. And uh, during this like jam session I had with the AI, I ended up making, or it made, I don't know, we made this whole album. And this album ended up being more organic and like nostalgic and emotional than anything I had made before. And so I'll just play a little bit of the video that I made. And these are old VHS clips run through where you point a camera at a TV and create feedback loops. And each instrument was assigned its own color. Instruments mix, the colors mix, so there's kind of a synesthesia. And it starts kind of nostalgic and ends up in this kind of going state. So the embarrassing thing is that the AI got onto this record label that I've been trying to get on for years. And so I felt kind of threatened in my career. I was like, okay, like, it, I just, I, so I gave up working with AI. I really haven't worked with it much uh, since then. Um, I'm very happy with the album it made. I'm happy for its success, but I, um, I'm butthurt. Uh, so then I decided to start working with people again. And this is just a traditional short film, but it, I realized it was my first step into how to turn movement into uh, sound. So it's kind of this hyper real type of uh, effect. And this was at the Berlin Independent Film Festival in 2016. I shot the whole thing in slow motion, so it was a million frames per second, and then would speed it up and slow it down. 
and then use some of the elements I learned from film scoring to essentially like create sound effects or movement sounds and paired it with it. Um, the cool thing about this is I shot it in like a storage room at a thrift shop in Chinatown in LA, just with a black backdrop. And so it wasn't like a professional set, it was just me with an iPhone, slow motion, and then a friend who's like really talented at costuming and movement. And then doing this kind of hyper real score on top of it. Yeah, the slow motion on the iPhone is phenomenal. I mean, just the detail that you can get. There's this like link that happens, which is like epic. Or no, it's the look up. And so that led to actually sonifying movement. So using motion sensors. At first I started with Arduino boards. They're pretty hard to keep an Arduino board on a dancer as they're moving. I tried, so you just like strap it down and like tie it on. The difficulty with the board is that there's the nine volt battery. And so it ends up being like the slingshot that flies across the room when it uh, pulls loose. Then I tried iPhones, like trying to get iPhones to stick to uh, a dancer with like pouches and whatever, and I cracked a lot of screens. And then um, end up using, this was a few years ago, so it's these mile wristbands. You can see it on uh, the dancer's okay. name's tie. It's on his right wrist and ankle. And it's a Bluetooth connection to the computer and it sends in accelerometer data, just like an iPhone. So it's XYZ data. And when you're still at zero, and this would be like one, two, three, and then minus one, minus two, minus three, in whatever direction, XYZ. Also has a gyroscope, but I, I don't use that as much. Um, and what I do is I work with different dancers and the idea came up originally uh, I met a dancer in Berlin and she had used motion sensors to control lights and she always wanted her motion to control the music. And because I had done the AI work, I knew how to disassemble and dynamically create music in real time. So I told her, oh, I could do that and we start working together. She was really excited about that idea. Um, with each dancer, I would spend time with them and they would choose their own uh, sounds that they wanted to use, like what was interesting to them and then spend time making sure that, okay, when I move like this, what sort of sound do I want to play? So it felt right to them. And it wasn't always necessarily the same sound. I would collect similar sounds into a batch. And so each time you do a certain movement, it would trigger a similar sound. So it wasn't so robotic or automatic of like click, click, but it'd be like, you know, something similar. And as long as it felt good to them, Essentially, I was creating, this is the beginning of creating these generative spaces where uh, the actual performance was all improv. There was no rehearsal, there was no, all right, I'm gonna be here and then I'm gonna go over here, I'm gonna do this. It was about the dancer moving into the space and essentially wherever they did visually or what sound came out would be cool because we spent time on the mapping. So if you get the mapping done, the rest, the improv is just all fine. Um, and what I saw with them is that they would put these things on and they would like, they would like move and feel super powered. All of a sudden, something that was really natural to them of dance was being augmented and rewarded and reinforced by having this, these sound waves come out of these speakers and hit them. They're like, I'm controlling this. You know, they started to feel like super powered or like magical. And what they were experiencing was biofeedback. And I was on the sidelines, you know, I had set this up and I watched with some envy as they were able to have these really powerful biofeedback systems. So Ty wanted this kid that was a mix of human sounds, like hitting his chest and making double sounds or his throat, his voice, mixed with these machine sounds because he wanted this work to be going from human to machine. So he's triggering samples on an octatrack, but it also can be done in human too. So when he stops, the music stops. So he's now the composer. He doesn't have to dance to music, his dance becomes the music. And my next iteration with this, I'll probably use these little discs called Move Sense, um, and they pick up heart rate and motion, and they're much lighter weight than the wristbands. One of the limitations of the wristband is that if you like tie it on, 
it's like you can't put it around your head, you can't put it around your torso, it either goes on your arm or your leg. Whereas the move sense come with these bands, so I can put one on my torso and be able to modulate or create sound through uh, movement of the head or the torso. Um, this is kind of my thing. So I presented here down in the conference room in 2020. Uh, this is a little bit of the aging music I presented back then. And the different brain waves, so the top one is blue, that's alpha. Um, the white ones down here are beta and gamma. It's kind of hard to see on this screen. The purple is theta. And then this one, it's really light, but that red is delta. And so what I'm doing is triggering different notes with the ups and downs of my brainwave activity, which we'll go into depth and explain how that can be done. And then the numbers of the different brain waves are here. So that's just the microvolts as they're coming in. And then I'm making choices visually uh, and acoustically or sonically with that data. Um, and then one of the things that I did just to evolve this was it felt like having the visuals behind me felt like the separation between me and the data and so I started projecting the brain waves uh, directly onto my body. And so this is also the body. So that's my arm and my head looking down. And so my brain waves are changing the color and the height of those waves in real time and create the music. So it's combining senses into a single focus rather than me being a performer sitting in front of a display. on the views, so that red light is the PPG, the heart rate monitor, and the white light is the power. And then this is something I did this summer, so it's, uh, instead of creating music, I was uh, controlling a subwoofer, which would uh, emit bass frequencies at specific uh, ranges, and create these beautiful patterns in water. And so that water, the movement of the water is being controlled by the busier my brain is, the more the water moves. And then there's moments where it gets a little still. I was a charm in the uh, dock lab. And I was new here, so I was nervous. It got a little still up there. Some people are good at that. Um, I think we've seen enough of me, so I'm gonna keep going. Uh, we wanna see. You want to see that? Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is something I did a few weeks ago. So I've got a uh, red light in front of me and uh, there's a speaker right off camera just blasting noise in my face. So that's being triggered by tension on my forehead in the EG. So it's picking up tension and creating this really difficult to escape biofeedback loop of stress. And then if I can focus inward strong enough, the noise dims down, it becomes a soothing bass sound and you'll see a blue light light behind me. And one of the things this illustrates is that with biofeedback loops, the sound, so if I use a stress trigger to create a certain type of stimulus, that then can make me more stressed. And it can be, you can get stuck in those. But you can also use it to your advantage. So if I'm rela relaxing, and I get a biofeedback, like a soft sound or something that relaxes me more, I can then get more and more relaxed. Uh, something I've experienced a number of times at shows was normally in meditation, I can dip a little bit down into relaxation or like a little bit into excitation in terms of uh, like a stimulating uh, meditation. And with this system, when I would relax, the music would meet me and then I could go further down, and then the music would meet me and I would go further down. Uh, I think it was at my second show, it was a big sound system, so I was getting vibration haptic response as well. I was feeling the bass waves hit me as my brain was making them. I got so relaxed, I went down into a normal meditation and then into a theta meditation, is where you start to dream, kind of, a, it's called hypnagogic, it's like these pre-dream states. Um, 
I forgot I was at a show. I'd gotten so relaxed on stage being watched by people. I literally, I opened my eyes. I was like, oh my God, there's people here. And so that's how deep down, I would never gotten to that in, in a particular uh, pre presentation situation. And then laddering up, August of 2019, I totally sober laddered up into a complete state of ecstasy. So I got excited, the music got more excited, I got more excited and just had this, I literally wept. It was the first time I ever cried on stage. I just like broke down with awe and wonder about life and the universe and the fact that this was happening in real time. Um, so those types of experiences is where biofeedback can uh, go in terms of like making these conscious choices of where you want the user to go with biofeedback. Uh, this experiment I'm doing right now is using repetitive beats to induce uh, a trance. And so I'm using the heart rate monitor to produce a kick sound and then listening to it. And so I did this for an hour and um, had this experience of laddering down into what's called alpha, which I'll get more in depth about, and then theta, which is that dream state. And essentially it's repetitive music has been used in um, traditional rituals and also in techno to induce these trance-like states of getting into these um, other states. And so I did uh, research here to, to induce that and then watch my brain waves as I was doing it. Okay, so now we're to the actual device. I can demo it, but I'll let you look at it. So the ER, the equipment room now has these, so you can grab them. Um, they go on like glasses, so they fit behind your ears, and then you can pinch them to make them snug on your forehead. And the sensors are here behind the ears, and then there's a couple on the forehead. And then there's a little, uh, when it's on, there's a red light, which is a PPG. So it's similar to um, a heart rate monitor, like a EKG or ECG, but it reads it by shooting a laser on your skin and looking for differences in light and dark. And what it's doing is it's watching the blood flow pass through blood vessels. And you get a signal that goes up and down, and that's your heart. And so you can get BPM and um, heart rate variability. Uh, so there's a, a bunch of sensors just in this. There's also uh, accelerometer, so you can get motion data uh, from these as well. Um, there's a gyroscope. I haven't used it much because I get really similar data, data from the accelerometer. That's a hard word to say, accelerometer. Um, so it's an interesting, I've, I've used it I mean, it's a commercial device that isn't really advanced. There's not the sensors over the head, but I've used it a lot because it does have all the sensors built into it. Uh, does anyone know FFT? Has anyone done FFT or P5 has an FFT function, if you've used that? Um, what FFT is, it's fast Fourier transform. It's a, that's a French mathematician. I'm probably not pronouncing it right. Zay, how would you pronounce Fourier? Four, F O. U R I E R. Fourier. Yes, thank you. Uh, so he was a mathematician in the 1800s who had figured out how to take data over time and convert it into frequency analysis. So anytime that you do like an EQ visualizer on like the old school stereo or even in Ableton when you pull up the, the EQ, it's doing a fast Fourier transform. It's taking time based signal, like music, music's a time based signal. Uh, Biosensors are time-based because it's updating every, I think it's like 30 times a second for the EEG. Um, and then what it does is it takes this time, you, there has to be a certain delay because it has to have like a certain amount of time to analyze the signal. And then it turns it sideways and all of a sudden you've got bass, mids, highs, you've got frequency data. And um, that's how you have visualizers with uh, music. Uh, with the EEG, essentially what is the base, the mids, and the high, neuroscientists have named as different brain waves. So the very lowest, the very basius is delta. And we're primarily in delta when we're unconscious and we're asleep and our bodies and brains are doing repair. So if you're not conscious and you're totally out. Um, the next, so you've got the basius sounds, the lowest, slowest sounds. And then next up is theta, and theta is um, kind of that dreamy state as you're falling asleep. So it's not fully asleep necessarily because that can be pretty active, 
but when you're falling asleep and you start to like imagine just these balloons, I call them like dream balloons, you know, where you just start to see other places or think about things that aren't your normal, like, oh, I have to go get groceries and have to, you know, do homework or whatever that is. That's, that's more beta. So theta is when you're drifting asleep. Uh, next up, so getting a little closer to the mids is alpha. And alpha is meditation. Um, so when you are resting and um, eyes closed will increase your alpha, uh, like breathing exercises, uh, any sort of meditation technique will raise your alpha. Alpha is a very comfortable wave. So once you get into it, you kind of like snuggle into it and you're happy to be there. Um, and beta, which is above it, is what we'd be in right now. So beta is like conscious, doing things, running around, uh, listening, learning. Uh, and the gamma is the highest frequency, so it'd be the very highs, you know, if it were music. Um, and gamma, one way to look at it is like delta is completely internally focused because you're unconscious and inward. And then theta is you're in a dream world, alpha is you're meditating, beta is you're awake. And gamma are these moments of intuition or insight, or it's kind of like standing on a cliff and looking over a valley of your own life and being like, oh, that's what's happening in my life right now. So it can be these really uh, interesting moments. Often they happen during meditation. So you can have a foundation of alpha and then have these bursts of gamma, of these moments of insight during meditation. Um, and so that's what the FFT produces. And essentially it's from like zero hertz like delta is like 0 0.1, 0 0.1. And then gamma, most of the neuroscientists I chat with cut it off at 60. I mean, the detection does go up, but as the frequency, this is the same with audio, as the frequencies go up, the amplitudes drop. So the bass waves have the biggest presence, just like in music. And then as you get higher and higher frequency, you get to a point where it's just too hard to detect. So a lot of them cut off at uh, 60. I talked a little bit about this. Um, if you Google, like, what do the brain waves do? You will get different answers. And there's no, like, solid, for sure. I mean, it's our brains, and there's a lot that we're, everyone's still discovering. Um, so you may, you know, like on one of these, let's see, there's different ones on this. Yeah, one will say that you're dreaming, one says the dreaming's in a different one. Yeah, Delta. Can you see my cursor? No. Um, so this is like deep dreamless sleep. And over here it's like sleep dreaming. So you're gonna find different information. There's, a, and the, I think the important thing in terms of making art and music from this is getting the EEG on and just seeing what your brain does and what your brain feels like and what that data looks like. And then choosing art and music that feels like the state that you're feeling. A lot of times people will ask with EEGs is, um, okay, if I put it on and I think of like a C chord, is that's what's gonna come out? Or if I think, um, I remember doing this early on, if I think the word one versus the word two, will I see that difference in the, in the data? And the best way to describe the resolution of these outside of the skull, you know, put it on outside the skin, is like being outside the stadium. So you can't hear individual conversations inside the stadium, but you can tell, are they cheering? Are they booing? Are they quiet? Are they, um, whatever the vibe is of the overall stadium, that's the signal you can pick up on. So if you think of like your brain as the stadium, you're outside the stadium. Now, I don't know if you'd be interested in doing this at ITP, but if you want to surgically implant a sensor inside your brain, you can be inside the stadium. But as long as these sensors are outside your skull, that's the level of resolution that you're gonna get. The other thing that's helpful for me is the idea that I mean, they're called waves for a reason, brain waves, is that as I compose with them, it's not as fast and articulate as like turning knobs on a synthesizer or playing keys on a keyboard. It's like moving through water. And you'll see this in the data. There's these like surges up and surges down. And when I make, like during a performance and I'm shifting mental states, it's not like I'm taking a 90 degree turn with a car feels like I'm turning a boat and as I turn that boat these ripples go off of the boat and those ripples are what the waves are on the EEG and it's a different way of composing because we're used to using our hands which are very 
uh, discrete, you know, just being able to draw a line on a, or, you know, type something on a keyboard. So it's, imagine making art and music with water or in the medium of water, and that's how, um, that's how I found, you know, is a useful way to, to think about creating. The other thing I've come across is this idea of biomorphism. Um, when there's human behavior, I guess animal behavior too, and nature, when there's life, there's these natural tendencies of ups and downs. They're not quantized. It's not like it's a solid beat, you know, every you know second or whatever. And it's this idea that if you just take straight from the brain the ups and downs and create music and create notes, what comes out is these compositions that are similar to like wind chimes or like birds chirping or wind going through a forest. It's this very organic, natural type of composition. Now, there's times where I've chosen to put a quantization on it. Like there's techno shows I've done it, which are quantized. Um, but on its own, just the raw data is this kind of biomorphic. Um, so if you look at like traffic trends or weather data or like stock market, they look like rainbows. Like all of them go up and down in these different types of uh, patterns. And you don't see like these, you know, hard, fast, like discrete events. You see this flow. I talked about value feedback a little bit already, but what's interesting about brain biofeedback as opposed to motion biofeedback is that the thing that's creating the music also then hears what it just made, you know, within a split second. And that's this really intense cycle that starts happening. You're like, well, I just, oh, I just made that. Oh, I just made that. Like over and over, you're constantly hearing what you just made. And like I mentioned earlier, that's allowed me to ladder up or ladder down. Um, another thing that I've considered with EEG work, there's two different, there's two different directions that, I mean, there's a million different directions you could go, but two that I've often considered. One is, do I just want to show what the brain is doing? Just like take the brain data and turn it into art and music? Or do I want to try to steer the brain into a specific uh, experience using the live data? So for example, if I'm creating like a meditation experience, I want to steer the brain into relaxation. Um, if I want, you know, the brain to get more excited or pumped up, you know, I can use different types of sounds and then see, is that working? And then have the music keep steering it in that direction. Um, there's a value to both of them. Um, I've often done mirroring, but entrainment does work. So if you play a tempo that's f faster than someone's heartbeat, their heart will start to raise. You know, if you play a tempo that's slower, they'll start to wind down. If you play ambient music, people get chilled out. If you play really chaotic, uh, rhythmic music, people get amped up. Um, and so that's a creative choice. Who takes the lead, the brain or the music? Um, before I get into this, any questions so far just about kind of general EG stuff? Yes? Have you ever, have you ever tried using the, the movements and the brain wave all together simultaneously? That's a great question. So one of the disadvantages of EEGs is that movement tends to uh, corrupt the data. So even just like blinking, um, so a lot of times I do it with eyes closed so I don't pick up links. Um, so muscular movement will trigger, particularly the, the low end, which actually this slide ends up being about. Uh, the low end on EEG data, it's gonna say it's delta, but more often than not, it's muscle tension. So, and that's valuable information. At first I was like, oh, I have to ignore all of the movement and muscle tension. Um, but it's a good way to tell if someone's stressed. You know, so if they have enough muscle tension in their forehead that's triggering these big delta spikes, that's valuable information. Um, now, if I were to put this on a dancer, I'm pretty sure the movement in the rest of the body would create too many spikes in the EEG data. Uh, what I have tried is putting it on an opera singer because we're curious to see if what is the brain doing when someone sings different languages at different uh, velocities. And the facial expression of the dancer kept just 
canceling out the EEG signals, just too much movement. And so in that project with that opera singer, we're moving the EEGs to the audience members and seeing, because the audience members can stay still and we've been, we've done some interesting experiments of seeing what's going on in their brains as they're listening to music. Um, but it's worth trying, because there is a motion sensor in there. Usually with the motion sensor, I just use it to like detect breath, because it's such a slight movement. Uh, the accelerometer can detect, you know, the inhale and the exhale, and then get a breath rhythm. Um, but it's worth trying. Any other questions? Movement, or, yes? Yeah, and that's where the, the creative work comes. So you can choose whatever sounds you feel fits. Um, I just finished a pilot program at a middle school where I installed the software on iPads and the students could hear their brains. And the important part of that is they choose their own sound kit because music is so contextual and cultural of why someone likes a certain sound but doesn't like other sounds. Um, so there's no, I shouldn't say no, I am looking at is there some sort of universal aspects of sound that go across culture? like. If something doesn't have a rhythm, is it more calming to most people? But a lot of music is based on preference and culture. So for myself, when I'm making my own art, I choose sounds I like. Um, and if I want that biofeedback amplification, I, I choose sounds that mirror the brain state I'm in. So if I'm really like stressed and excited, I could put distortion and a lot of rhythm and a lot of intensity to the sound. And that will accurately express what I'm feeling. Um, what I tend not to do is, let's say I get to a relaxed state, I don't wanna play a really abrasive or sharp sound because it'll take me right out of that relaxed state. And it depends on what you wanna do. If you wanna go deeper into those biofeedbacks, or maybe you're trying to prevent someone from relaxing. So anytime they relax, they get a and it like keeps them out of it. So it depends on the, the design. But thinking of the sounds and the sounds you choose in a conscious way of like, what impact do I want? What sort of feedback do I want to give to the user when they enter a certain state? Because what the EG can detect is what state the person's in. Or they fall asleep, or they're meditating, or they're stressed out. Um, there's, you know, the more sensors you have, the more data you have. So this is limited with four sensors. But even with this, you can get those states pretty clear. Falling asleep, uh, meditating, uh, stress. I've seen some people be able to raise their gamma. I can't. Um, but um, that's worth experimenting with. Did that answer the question? The sound? Yeah. Um, can you put brainwave sensor to animal? What's that? Like, can you apply the brainwave sensor to animals? To animals? Uh, you could. Uh, so with this one, you'd probably have to shave the fur um, because it needs to be on skin. It doesn't work through hair. But there's other types of EEGs that have, I don't have it with me, but have, they're not sharp, but these metal prongs that are used to go through hair and that could fit onto, you might have to create your own that fits, I mean, how big of an animal, you know, if it's like a big dog head, it might be similar to a human head. Um, some considerations I found with EEGs is that the bigger the brain, the more electricity comes off of it. So when I've done demos and like a little kid tries it, their signal's pretty weak just because their brain is literally a smaller electrical organ in terms of producing, you know, those microvolts that come off of it. That, that question comes up a lot. I think mm -hmm. people are really curious what their dogs are thinking. What do you, how do you think this, like, differentiates from, let's say, a musician playing <coughs> instrument? Because, like, you were talking about, like, how you, like, you want it to be, like, ambient sound. Mm -hmm. Like, and then, like, traditionally, the musician would just play the ambient sound and that reflects what they're thinking. Like, right. do you think, like, do you think this, like, how do you think this adds to the, like, existing, um, I don't know, like, the existing way of playing music? For me, the real advantage was vulnerability. So, for 
many years, you know, I'd have a drum machine, maybe a computer, a synthesizer in front of me. And as long as I like hit the buttons and turn the knobs, the same music came out. And with using the biosensors to shape the sounds, people could tell, am I tired? Am I nervous? Am I excited? Because that comes out in the music. And so for me, it was removing that wall, removing that armor of hiding behind the machines and having this experience that was uh, more open. The other thing I found, particularly with tempo, so a lot of times I'll use the PPG on here to grab my heart rate and then set the tempo of the music to my heart. Like as a, I, I don't DJ a whole lot, but as a DJ, I never know when to like, you know, increase the tempo or decrease it. It always sounds like awful and off. Like, shit, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, but when it's set by my heart, my heart naturally knows when the music's more exciting or when it's calming down. And so tempo changes based on the heart are much better than I could do with my decision-making will. Uh, and the other thing that's been really interesting that shows is this entrainment that happens that when music is coming from my body, the people who are in the room, particularly over time, tend to sync up with what I'm feeling and where I'm going yeah. because my body is making this music in real time. And what it does is it removes that training. So if I'm a classical musician, my training's gonna kick in. I'm like, I'm gonna play this song and I'm gonna perform, I'm in performance mode. But with biosensors, during particularly longer shows, I go through all sorts of, you know, at first I'm worried and then I start to relax and then I go into these really deep subconscious states and then I wonder like, you know, if it's a dark warehouse techno show, I'm like, is anyone out there? And then, you know, I kind of come to, and then it's like the you know, end of the show. It's this whole journey that I go on, and other people, their bodies seem to sense that they're listening to another body and start to sing up like that. So for me, it's more about this human connection and vulnerability. That's a great question. Uh, other things that come off the muse, so, uh, when you check out the Muse from the equipment room, there's this app, it's the same one here, it's called Mind Monitor, and it doesn't produce music or anything, but it just gives you good charting, you know, so it's a good chance to like, put on the EG and see what your brain does, you know, take a nap on it and do a screen record, you know, work on homework, do a phone call, uh, get into flow with code, and just see what your brain is doing, so that's a good way to get a sense of what values come off your brain when you're doing different things. Uh, so I mentioned, yeah, Delta is the red line in um, Mind Monitor. And uh, so that's mostly muscle tension. Alpha is the blue line. So that's when you get into meditation. Uh, when I listen to music, my alpha goes up. So if during the performance I start to get lost, I just listen to the music that my brain is producing and that helps my alpha go up. So there's something about alpha going up with uh, music. And when I learned that, I realized when I was a kid and kind of stressed out just about like life stuff, um, I would have some sort of radio song in my head, just constantly, just like whatever the recent thing I heard, and it still happens to me, but you know, music goes through my head. And what that was doing is when I play music in my own head, it increases my alpha, which is soothing. And so that's a way to self-soothe is having that music loop in my head. Um, the other thing I learned about alpha, which is worth mentioning, is it's a suppressive wave. So a lot of the other waves will go up when you're stimulated. Alpha goes up when you go inward and you're blocking out reality. Uh, so for example, if I was at a really noisy restaurant and I was trying to listen just to Pedro, my alpha would go up spatially in my head everywhere except Pedro. And so alpha would be up here and that's what blocks out the noise of the restaurant, the, the lights and the chatter. Um, I don't know if you've ever like taken a recorder, either a phone or a field recorder, and tried to record a conversation in a noisy space. It's so hard to hear the conversation that you heard in real time. That's an effect of alpha. Like alpha blocks out reality, whereas a microphone picks up all the noise in, in a space. Any questions about alpha? Uh, the other thing that I found after kind of some funny experiments, um, I was in LA a year or so ago, and I had a friend, so as I was falling asleep into those kind of like 
it's called hypnagogic, but those like pre-dream blooms. I would tap my finger and she would screenshot what my brain was doing at that moment on my monitor. And what I found is if alpha is the top wave and then theta is the second wave, the purple one, that's a really good indicator that someone's shifting into that theta state. So usually theta doesn't become the top one, but if it's alpha, then theta, and then the rest of them, you know the person's starting to go into that, those dreams. And that's something, you know, if uh, dream states is interesting to creatively, something that you could work with, and this headset does pick that up well. <sighs> like beta and gamma, I wish I could get like really consistent like if I could focus my mind and get a strong beta off of this, that would be great. But I think the design of this particular headset, just being the, the front, the forehead, and the back, the ears, I personally haven't gotten good beta or gamma. I encourage other people to test, like try doing different focus activities and see if you can get beta. Maybe I'm looking at the wrong ranges, but for me, I haven't used them a lot just because I can't get my brain to, to get them to go up. Um, I have met some people who could like focus on their third eye and their gamma went up and it was really consistent. I tried it, it didn't work for me. Mm. Then the other things are pretty much talked about. Do people know what heart rate variability is? Do people not know what heart rate variability <laughs> is? Okay. Uh, so even just in, you know, if you just grab any sort of, um, electrode or uh, there's different heart rate sensors you can get for Arduino, so this could be useful. Uh, so the first thing you get with uh, a repeating heart signal, it, as you get the, the heart to beat, is you can detect the BPMs, like how many BPMs there are in a second, so you know how fast the heart is going. The other thing that's come up with a lot of different sensors, whether it's like low ring sensors or wristbands, the Apple Watch can do this, is if you measure the distance between the beats, you can get a sense of the overall stress and health of the entire system, of the entire body. Uh, it's a little counterintuitive, so if the time between each beat, no matter how fast or slow it is, but if the time between each beat is equal, that means someone's stressed and their, their system is distressed, kind of an unhealthy state. So if your heart is acting like a machine, that means you're kind of in a fight or flight or like too stressful. Now, if the time between the beats is like lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, that means it's healthy. So the heart's not stressed and it's just beating whenever it feels like it. Just like whenever the, flo the uh, blood flows into the heart, fills up, pumps it out. So it's not acting like a machine, it's not in fight or flight. So by detecting heart rate variability, that's a way that you can tell, just with a heart rate sensor, you can pick up a, like a stress level or a relaxation level. And then the last one is the exhalometer, which I mentioned. Um, so as you breathe in and breathe out, you're just gonna get a spike. And you can do breath rate, so you can also detect how someone's stressed out is based on their breath rate, if they're breathing fast or slow. Um, and then you can do other things. So it, uh, sometimes I've used, in a DJ situation, I've used the accelerometer to like open or close filters. So like at the end of the set, I can't turn my brain off and be like, okay, I'm gonna shut off my brain, the music's gonna stop. But if I put my head down and uh, have that close of filter, it's a way to finish a composition. Oh, so I created a P5 sketch that connects to the Muse and brings all the uh, variables in for you. So that's something that I'll share with anyone who's interested in using it. One of the things that hasn't happened yet, so I've reached out to the admin, the editor of the, the P5 editor website. Um, there's this web Bluetooth uh, permissions policy thing. It's working on open processing, but it's not working on the P5 editor. So the sketch doesn't work on the P5 editor. Now, if you're on VS Code and doing things locally, that's fine. Does anyone here just use the P5 editor? I wonder if this is even a thing. Do you use the P5 editor? I do. Okay, anyone else just use the P5 editor? Andy? Okay, okay, so we got some nods. A lot of first years. Yeah, yeah. and th that's where they started us in the summer uh, as well, on the low-risk program. Um, 
So my goal is to get it over to P5 where you can just like load my sketch, duplicate it. And what will happen, let's see. It only works in Chrome. That's a web Bluetooth thing. So I'm gonna turn this on. There's a power switch here. And I'm gonna run this sketch. So you've got this connect button. And then web Bluetooth does the trouble of like finding the device. And when it finds it, it'll list, it's not a serial number, but a little identify number up here. So it says Muse, and that has a little ID number. I'm gonna pair it. And then when it's connected, that button switches to start. And so when I start, so this, these are the live numbers coming from the sensor. Uh, something I didn't mention. So EGs, the signal is louder when it's not connected to someone, because it's just pure noise. And so when you put it on, the values slowly get smaller and smaller, and so it finds the signal inside the noise. So as I, right now these numbers are in the hundreds, the brain waves here, and the BPM is jacked because it's not detecting an actual BPM. So when you put it on, it takes 10 seconds, 20 seconds to start getting real values. These numbers are starting to drop. Get the battery here and then you have the motion down here so this is the gyroscope and the accelerometer um, the important thing is all of this that you see is happening in the sketch.js so when you open up p5 you're working in sketch.js so you don't have to deal with web bluetooth you don't have to deal with finding this you don't have to do with the fast Fourier transform that's all the work i've done the last couple of weeks is processing that and what's being delivered into the sketch date JS is access to delta, theta, alpha, beta, gamma. And then once it's in there, you can do whatever you want with it. So that was my goal the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I have a question. Please. So essentially in every point of brain activity, you are getting all five types of waves, right? Yeah. Then if, if, this, if this is working correctly, you should be in the best as beta now, right? Because you're active. Correct, and which is my first. But it's not the highest like, value. Why is it like? Why is it the waking state that the whole bit beta? Like I have yep. a hard time to that base. No, that's a great question. So that's my frustration with this particular headset, yeah. is that why isn't beta the highest right now? Yeah. And yeah. part of it is with uh, fast Fourier transform, the lowest frequencies have the biggest amplitudes, and then it goes down. Mm -hmm. um, so originally when I started working with this, I was like, oh, clearly delta is stress. I thought delta was the waking, uh, you know, active mind. Um, with this particular headset, the things that I can reliably get, and I encourage everyone to experiment and, and try to see what you can find, is I can pick up my muscle tension from delta, which is a good translation of how stressed I am. So I essentially use that delta value as the beta. Uh, this headset is really good at detecting alpha. So if I close my eyes and meditate and relax, alpha would start to be higher than the rest of them. And that's a really good indicator that I'm relaxed. And then um, that theta, uh, so if alpha is the highest and theta is the second, it's a really good indicator that I'm starting to fall asleep. And so those three, um, I've gotten pretty consistently from this. And that's my frustration with the beta and gamma. Um, I've heard that sensors that are in the top of the head, so there's the motive and then open BCI, you can put the sensors wherever you want to, are better for picking up beta, like good beta signal, or the back of the head. But this one being the forehead and the ears, um, that is a limitation of this device. But the rest of the concepts are the same, you know, regardless of what the device you have. Um, I'm glad you asked that because that's something that was 
confusing to me. Any other questions? What is gyro? Uh, it's a gyroscope. Yeah, so it'd be kind of the angle of movement. I haven't used it a lot, but I am feeding the variable into the sketch if other people. So if you wanted, I mean, you could do use this just as a motion sensor as well and not worry about the, the EEG data being spiked. Um, but I often use accelerometer. It, I think gyroscope will give you like where the terms pitch, yaw, those like plain terms. Um, whereas accelerometer will give you direction, but also velocity. So if I do this, that's going to be different than that. You know, this will be like a five and this will be like a two. And for dance, it gravitate towards those. Any other questions? And then once you have these numbers, you can chart it, you can just anything you can do in P5 with a sensor value that's going up and down, like these values are, are coming into the sketch. Um, another thing I do is, at first I just focused on individual brain waves. And what I found, because the brain can be really intense and stressed out, or it can be pretty quiet, or if, like the brain is smaller if you get it on a dog or a kid. Uh, instead of looking at the absolute values of thinking, okay, every time alpha is above 10 microvolts, I'm gonna do a certain thing, or a certain percentage above 10, I'm gonna do a certain thing. What I do instead is I look at the relationship between the waves. So is alpha above delta? You know, is that meditation signal above muscle tension? If so, it doesn't matter if the brain is really stressed out or bigger or you know smaller. Uh, you're still going to get that relationship difference. So that's one of the important ways I've looked at composing with this. Kind of treating it like a family. There's distinct relationships between all the different waves, and changes in those relationships change the dynamics of the whole system. Any other questions? Yeah. I have a question actually about something you were talking about earlier. Sure. With AI. I'm curious, like, like how you go about training an AI to like compose music? Because I would think it's like, you know, teaching an AI like, music theory, what sounds good to a human and what doesn't sound good. So I wonder how do you kind of translate that sort of human knowledge into something that like, an AI can Because I stumbled into AI in such a backwards way, so I don't know machine learning, that's something I'll be learning in the spring, or maybe it's summer semester. Um, the way I did it is having musicians use it. And so the data entry wasn't a big data set, it was just the person opened the app and started making their own music with it. In the beginning, it wasn't as responsive, but the more they used it, or the more I used it, the system inside the app would warp and wrap around my personal style. And so the user itself was the data source, which is slow. <laughs> um, but I found it was effective because it would then make music similar to the author and put them out work. Or be a good robot bandmate. You know, it would make some crazy decision. You're like, why'd you do that? You know, so it's a similar aesthetic. Well, thank you everyone for your interest in biometrics and sensors and AI and all the cool stuff we do here at ITP. Thank you.